Okay, we're gonna finish up uh, talking about floods today. So last class, we went through some of the science behind how rivers work. We talked about upstream areas that have steep gradients. Places in the mountains tend to have small watersheds, steep gradients, mountain streams, V-shaped valleys, water moves quickly. In order to get floods in those areas, you have to have a lot of rain fall in a really short amount of time so that the steep slopes aren't able to get the water out of there quick enough. And then we talked a little about downstream areas, areas where the gradient is flatter. Rivers tend to be wider, more meandering. In order to get flooding in those areas, you have to have rain accumulate over a big area so that it inundates all the tributaries coming into a particular river. So you get different conditions required for flooding in different parts of the earth. So we're gonna spend some time today talking about flooding, some of the effects, how humans combat flooding and how flooding has impacted humans. So we'll just start out with this slide, just kind of a US slide looking at our deadliest floods here in the US. And this is not in terms of damage, but just in terms of deaths. The worst flood on record happened in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. There's been lots of books written about this flood, how it affected the culture there afterwards. It's pretty interesting how one natural hazard can have such an effect on a community. But this was a combination of human caused events and nature events. They had several days of extremely heavy rain, which with the fact that they had a dam upstream from Johnstown that collapsed, led to a sudden release of water. Uh, the water was ridiculously high. It was a wall of water about 30 feet high. And when water moves that fast and that powerfully, it becomes more than water. It becomes water plus everything that it picks up along the way. I'm gonna show you a video of a flash flood in a few minutes from Utah. And you'll see that it's probably more other things than water at some point. You know, it just becomes so erosive and so powerful that it just picks up everything um, and moves it downstream in a wall of almost like concrete at some point. Uh, the second most deadly flood in US history occurred in Los Angeles when the St. Francis Dam collapsed. This water was being stored for drinking and use for the city of Los Angeles. Um, it had a small leak, it was inspected. Um, the day before, everybody said, oh, it's fine. And then in the middle of the night, the dam collapsed, same sort of thing, a wall of water headed downstream, wiping out communities and killing 450 people. Um, both of these could have been prevented to some degree if humans had built their structures a little stronger and had paid a little more attention to how they were holding up during these heavy rain events. And then you can see some of the other floods listed here as well. So that is flooding in terms of deaths, the worst in the United States. Worldwide, when you compare the numbers, the U.S. has uh, gotten off pretty easy in terms of some of the most deadly floods. Um, some of these are terrible. If you look at the first one on here, three and a half million people in China killed by one flood event. Months long, heavy rains inundated a river downstream, spread water out over a huge area. You can see that the five most deadly floods have occurred in China. Not surprisingly, it has the most people, but um, they also have weather that leads up to this as well. Um, Johnstown flood, which is tops on the list in the US, would be 51st worldwide. So flooding is an issue all over the planet, not just here in the US. Okay, so let's look at the two types of floods in a little more detail. If you're in the mountains, the types of flooding that are most likely to impact you would be flash floods. Flash floods occur when you get a lot of rain in an area that has steep slopes, basically mountainous regions. 
And the idea is to get so much rain that the steep slopes can't shed the water quick enough. So this is intense rainfall, a couple inches per hour. A light drizzle, a light snowfall isn't going to do it. Sure, the rivers will rise, but to get them the flood requires much heavier rain. And remember, the watersheds that are in mountainous regions tend to be small compared to the downstream areas. Downstream areas take up sometimes states, sometimes regions. These mountainous watersheds may be a few hundred acres, a few thousand acres. It's pretty easy for a thunderstorm just to sit over an entire watershed in the mountains, rain hard, and accumulate enough water for a flash flood. And when this happens, the runoff is so intense that it can't soak into the ground fast enough. And the river can't move the water away fast enough. So the water levels go up. And it tends to happen very quickly. One of the biggest hazards that you have outside recreating in mountainous west in the summer is when thunderstorms happen upstream of where you might be camping or recreating. A lot of people in the past have camped in dry washes. If you've been out in the desert, deserts tend to be rocky areas, not always a good place to put down a tent, but then you see this nice sandy wash. So people put their tents in it, and it might not even rain where their tent is, but if it rains upstream, it can send a wall of water down, and people have died in the western U.S. from exactly this type of event. I tell most of my classes this. Um, hydrologists, scientists that study rivers, have kind of a rule of thumb for entering waterways. It's called the rule of 10. I use this pretty faithfully because I fish a lot. I'm always wading out in streams and sometimes I, you look at a river and it's you see the water moving and you wonder you know can I walk out into that thing or is it going to wash me away well this rule of 10 is actually kind of helpful it basically says is you take the depth of the river in feet times the velocity of the river in feet per second and you multiply those two things together and if it's 10 or more you're not going to stay up in the river. You're going to get washed away most likely. So if the river is one foot deep and the water's moving 10 feet per second, which is really fast, you're not going to be able to stand up in that. Now, if the water is only two feet deep, which is, you know, knee height, if it's moving five feet per second, a little less than my body length, you're going to have a hard time standing up in that. And you can kind of estimate. You can see a leaf or something float by and just go, 1001, see how far it travels during that time. If it moves five feet, two feet deep, I don't think I would enter that water. If it's three feet deep, it only has to move this far in a second, and you're not going to be able to stand up in it. So rule of 10, I'm not going to ask you this on any test. It's just in case you like to spend time in the water like I do. If you're ever worried about your ability to stand up in it, think of the rule of 10. Now, most deaths that we get here in the United States with respect to flooding has to do with people in cars. People who are driving home, driving to work, driving somewhere and they come across a stream that has flooded a roadway. And people, they sit there and they look at the river and they see the water washing over the road and they wonder if they can drive through it. If the water's ever more than two feet deep and moving, don't drive into the stream. You shouldn't drive into it anyway, because even six inches of water moving really fast can take out a car. But if it's two feet deep, don't drive into it. Because cars, because of the tires and because of the air held inside, initially are buoyant. They float. And all it takes is about two feet of water for your car to start floating. 
So anytime you see water pouring over a roadway and it's two feet deep, absolutely don't drive through it. If it's pouring over a roadway, you probably shouldn't drive through it anyway. If it's an inch deep, you might be able to get away with it. I personally won't drive through anything six inches deep or more. So that's how most people end up dying in floods here in the US. People in cars driving through flooded roadways. And you can just get on the internet and find lots of videos showing people driving. I'm gonna turn the lights out so you can see this. This is some flash flooding from southern Utah a few years ago. Guy was out with a zone camera and a drone. And you can see just how fast this actually moves. And you can see that it's not mostly water. Those people right there, that's not smart. <laughs> this stuff is highly erosive. Fast moving water, fast moving trees. You're gonna see a boulder that's several cubic meters. And remember, a rock is about a ton per cubic meter. So this is a three or four ton boulder that's being washed down the stream here in a minute. Just give you an idea of just how powerful this is. So a uh, grassy bank, yeah, you don't wanna be in the way of that. I don't think I'd put my Jeep there. So here's a completely dry stream bed. And you notice it's not raining here. It's raining upstream from this particular point. You can see the clouds in the background. I wish I had sound for this because it's actually incredibly noisy as these roots and logs and rocks tumble down the stream, bash together. But the other thing to notice is that this is not a huge river like the Mississippi River. These are pretty small volume streams. So something like a thunderstorm can send down enough water to fill these fairly quickly if it rains hard enough. Now this amount of water, you plop this into the Amazon or Mississippi, it's hardly going to make a dent in it. So you need different conditions when you're downstream and have big rivers. But this is a pretty decent flash flood and pretty good footage. Drones are awesome. I don't know if I'd want to fly my brand new drone over this, but. Okay. So just a little video of flash flood. You can find more on the internet if you poke around and want to see some good damage. These are, are pretty impressive. So those are upstream floods, flash floods, floods that tend to happen in mountainous regions. Now downstream floods behave quite a bit differently and they're formed by different conditions as we've mentioned a couple times already. These tend to cover huge areas. And when I mean huge areas, 
for your frame of reference, we're talking entire states, several states. We're talking rivers like the Mississippi River, the Ohio, the Missouri. Large rivers carry large volumes of water. Worldwide, we're, you can think of this as being like the Amazon or the Nile, Irrawaddy. Some of the greatest rivers on earth would have downstream floods when they flood. So as we mentioned earlier, one little thunderstorm is not going to send enough water down to flood these big rivers. You need rain over a huge area. Or you need snow melt over a huge area. Or in this particular region of the world, what really does it is when we get rain on top of snow. The snow is melting. It's obviously warm enough for the snow to melt if the rain is falling. And then the rain falls on top of it. That actually accentuates the melting. So it's like a triple whammy. You got snow melt, you have extra snow melt because rain's falling on it, and you have the rainfall as well. So when that happens over a large region, then that can be enough to swell some of these big rivers enough so that they will come out of their banks. And we already know that people love to live along big rivers. Rivers provide food sources, routes of travel and commerce. The other thing when you get these long duration rainfall events, rain for three or four days, or snow that's been melting for a week, the ground gets saturated with rain and can't absorb anymore. So that means that any additional snow melt or rainfall runs off the Earth's surface into little drainages that eventually take it to these rivers. So this is an, event, an example of a downstream flood. You won't see a big wall of water typically unless something like a dam fails, but the water levels gradually rise over the period of days or weeks, eventually flow out of their banks. And because these are large rivers, when they do finally reach their capacity, they spread out over huge areas. So you can see in this photo right here, for about as far as you can see, this thing is underwater. Another example, you notice the water is brown. Remember, floods contain more than just water. It contains the sediment that they're carrying as well. So even after the water recedes, a lot of that sediment's going to remain behind. And you notice these houses are flooded, they're inundated. And one of the most awful things about having your home impacted by flood is trying to remove all the sediment, all the mud afterwards, even once the water goes away. Your house is full of dirt, sometimes a couple of feet deep, and obviously really difficult to clean up. But that sediment also puts down a fresh layer of soil. So anybody that's doing any farming in the region has nice, fertile, fresh soil full of new nutrients to deal with. So. From a human standpoint, flooding certainly creates problems. If you have people that are in the flooded water or buildings that are in flooded water, but it's also nature's way of replenishing soils that are very fertile. And with a growing human population, farming and making the most of our agriculture is going to be a concern going forward. So we tend to talk about floods and a lot of these natural disasters in really negative terms. But for just about all of them, you're also going to find some positives as well.
So I don't want to just dwell on the negative aspects of this. Flooding is very essential to good agriculture in these downstream areas. Okay, do you guys have any questions at this point? Okay, I'll let everybody take a second, catch up on the notes. If I go too fast and you're having a hard time keeping up with your notes, just throw your hand up, let me know. I'm happy to slow down. Okay, a couple of terms that you might hear if you live along riverways that flood on occasion. The National Weather Service, United States Geological Survey, two government organizations that deal with flooding and put out alerts to citizens, use terminology that sometimes not everybody knows. One term that they use a lot is called flood stage or stage. Stage is depth. How deep or how high does the river have to rise in a, water have to rise in a river for it to exceed the banks and flood? So in this graph that I have, on the left, it says stage and feet. And it goes from 2 to 26 feet. So right here at 16, you see a line. And that's where minor flooding starts. So if you have 8 feet of water in your stream, it's fine. Banks are higher than that. Water level goes up to 12 feet. 12 feet deep is pretty deep. A little deeper than from the floor to the ceiling in here. Still okay in this particular river. You're not in the flooded area. You can even go 15 feet. Now it's getting really close to the edge of the banks. Once it hits 16 feet, that's where it spills out for this particular river. Some rivers are much deeper. You know, on the Mississippi, it might be 50, 60 feet. Other rivers, like some of the rivers we have around here, might be 10 or 12 feet deep. So we will have a graph like this for every stream. And it'll tell you, you know, if it's 15 feet deep in this stream, you're okay, but it's getting close. 16 feet, you're going to have minor flooding. You get major flooding around 19 feet. So stage is the depth at which a particular stream will flood. And flood to the extent that will probably cause damage to property and pose some threat to human life as well. Discharge, we talked about a little last class. It's the amount of water flowing in a stream past a particular point every second. We measure this in units like cubic feet per second or cubic meters per second. Some volume of water moving past a point every second of time. And in the same diagram, we have stage or depth on the left side, but on the right side, we have discharge or flow in this case. And the units there are in thousands of cubic feet per second. So you can see down at the bottom, you have goes from 0.1 to somewhere around 20 up at the top. And remember that's in thousands of cubic feet per second. So let's say you're right here at 3.6. That's 3,600 cubic feet per second. That's about enough to flood parts of the Poudre River. So if this was the Poudre River, that would probably be enough to cause flooding. This particular stream is probably a little bigger than that. It requires, it says 5.9 times 1,000. So this is 5,900 cubic feet per second. You get minor flooding. When you get 5,900 cubic feet per second, this particular river will be 16 feet deep. So you'll have a different graph like this for 
lots of different rivers and even different places along a particular river. So flood stage is the depth that it floods at. Flood discharge is the amount of water in the stream that will cause flooding. And this diagram I've been showing is something called a hydrograph. It's simply a graph that shows either the depth of water or the discharge of the stream or both over time. So if you look at this top diagram here, you can see that at first water level is really low, discharge is really low, and then there's some sort of event that causes a big rush of water to come into that river. And you can see it spike up there to 19 feet in stage and it looks like maybe about 9,000 cubic feet per second. And at that point in that river, you have major flooding. So it went from about three feet deep to almost 20 feet deep in a very short period of time. Here you can see just a couple of days, in about two days. So real rapid water movement. Then you see the water level drops and then either get another snow, storm or snow melt event or whatever's happening to cause that much water to come into the river. Down below is a hydrograph. So higher you go up, the more water's in your river versus time. And it's showing the discharge profile at three different places down from a stream. So here you have, or down from a lake. Here you have a lake. You have a stream coming out of the lake. A is closest to the lake. And you had some sort of event that caused a lot of water to go in your stream and you see the discharge spikes. Downstream a bit is B. You see it takes a little longer for the peak to get there. And the peak's a little lower. Why do you think the peak would be a little lower as the stream moves down away from the lake? Basically, it has a little less water flowing in it. Why would you have more water flowing at point A, and then by the time all that water got to B, there's actually less of it there? Where do you think some of that water went? Yeah, it soaks into the soil along the banks. Now, over time, that water will come back out, but actually that soaking into the ground lessens the chance of flooding that you get downstream. Now, if that ground was all saturated, though, from weeks of snowmelt, you might not see that decrease in that peak discharge. And then that would make the flooding downstream a lot worse. So a lot of uh, flood water actually is stored in the banks of the river on a short-term basis. And that can keep flooding from being worse than it is. All right, let's look at what happens during a flood. So there's some primary effects, direct effects, where you come in contact with water and its aftermath. Obviously the ones that people are the most worried about is injury and loss of human life, pets, livestock, Clearly we care about that the most, but we're also impacted heavily if things that we build or rely on are damaged as well. Buildings, roadways, bridges, It's one thing I think a lot of folks don't realize is the bridges that you see over every river in the United States. They're just not sort of put up in the most quick manner possible. Oh, let's just get something over this river that we can drive across. Those bridges are constructed in a way to handle flooding. Bridges are supposed to be built in the U.S. to handle floods of a certain size for every river. So in some cases you'll see bridges arched up really high over a river for no apparent reason. It's like, I don't know why they would do that. Well, the reason is, is that that particular river floods in a certain way 
often enough that the bridge needs to be built in a manner that it can let that water move underneath. Because one thing you don't want is water rising to the base of your river and then having your, or the uh, water rising to the base of your bridge and then having your bridge act like a little dam or something. So bridges are designed to carry floods beneath them of certain sizes. And then obviously erosion can impact property, buildings, erosion strips away soil. The flip side is we get deposition of sediment from floods as well. We get some secondary effects of flooding. These tend to happen after the flood leaves and these effects linger on. One of the problems we had here in Colorado in 2013 is we had huge floods in September, some of the biggest floods ever on record in Colorado. But during that time, we also had an oil and gas boom. And we had lots of oil and gas facilities sitting on floodplains. And in particular, we had petroleum being stored in huge tanks along floodplains. And many of these were wiped out by the floods. And all the petroleum that was being carried in those big containers actually let loose, polluted some of the streams. So things that are on the floodplain can become pollution for floods. And these effects can linger on for some time. When you have big downstream floods, especially in highly populated areas and countries that are not well developed, hunger, disease can come on fairly quickly. Homelessness, temporary and long-term. With flash floods, homes tend to be wiped away. With downstream floods, they tend to sit in the water for some time. You end up with lots of sediment. You end up with mold problems, both of which can be not only damaging, but deadly in the long run. And then there's the economic losses. People can't get to work, businesses perish if impacted too profoundly by the floods. Insurance rates go up. Even if you're not in an area that is flooded, you might be impacted by that flood just through higher insurance rates for everybody. Okay, there's some other things that happen that can make flooding worse. And one is building stuff on a floodplain. We love to build things on a floodplain. First, we like to be along rivers for all the nice things that rivers provide. But the other reason that floodplains are so nice is that they're flat, easy to build on. You don't have to do a lot of earth moving like you would on a hillside. Nobody builds their house all crooked because there's a hill. You always carve out a nice flat area. Floodplains are great. They're nice and flat. So sadly, people build on floodplains all the time. And they might get away with it. They might get away with it for a long time. Sometimes it's 10, 20, 30 years before major floods on some floodplains. But eventually, a floodplain is going to flood. That's what it does. So if you build on a floodplain, eventually it is going to impact you. It might not get you at first. It might take a few years. But when it happens, it happens and it can be pretty profound. The bad thing about building on a floodplain is that, one, Anything built on a floodplain is going to be damaged, obviously, when there's a flood. But having all that stuff on the floodplain takes up room for the water to flow. 
So what that does is it actually makes the water levels higher because there's less space for that water to spread out because there's buildings all over. So building on a floodplain actually makes the flooding worse. And the more building you have, the higher the water is going to rise to get around all of that human-built nonsense that you find on floodplains. How it impacts people is obviously a product of how effective meteorologists and hydrologists are at predicting what's going to happen with the weather and with the subsequent runoff that would make the flooding itself. And then the land always changes. You might have an area that might behave one way with a storm one year, but then because of people building on it or because of fire, you change the amount of water that's going to run off. One thing we know about forest fires is that it increases not only the amount of water that runs off, but it increases the amount of sediment as well. It's very erosive after a forest fire. Those trees are dead. They're not sucking up any water. All the debris from the fire is then washed into the stream. That adds to the volume of material in the stream, rises up the level of the stream even faster. So burning and paving and changes in your watershed can actually change from one flood to the next and greatly complicate some of the warnings that scientists have to make. Floods, because they move so fast, change things. They change the dimensions of the rivers. They erode the banks. They change the capacity of the river. They carry sediment. So depending on whether they're doing more erosion or deposition, they are going to change the river as it's occurring. And that complicates the ability for scientists to make accurate predictions of when floods might occur. Sometimes you just get weird events that are kind of unprecedented. Scientists haven't had experience with them. Rainfall that's beyond what we've measured before or fires that have impacted such a huge area that we don't know how the watershed's going to respond. So sometimes we come across conditions that make it really difficult to judge the rise of the water, how fast it's going to occur, how long the flood's going to impact an area. Because every flood changes the river that existed before and changes what's going to happen next in terms of how the river can respond to future events. Even things like what season it is can greatly affect how floods occur. Typically in the winter, we have low flow rates in most rivers here in this part of the country because it's cold enough that the water stays on the land in the form of snow. But every once in a while, we get ridiculously high temperatures in February. It's not unheard of to have 80 degree days in February in this part of the world. It happens. And when that happens, you can get massive snow melt and ice melt part of the year where you're not expecting it. And those can be really difficult for scientists to forecast because they just don't happen frequently enough for us to really understand what's going to occur. We talked about this a little bit already. Rivers carry more than just water, carry sediment as well. When you have a fire suddenly in one area, that's going to change the type of sediment that stream usually carries. You get these nice clear mountain streams. 
that don't carry a lot of small sediment. They carry lots of big rocks. But if you happen to get a forest fire in that area for a season or two, a lot of fine grain material that washes out of the burn scar might accumulate in your stream, start to fill up the channel, lessening the amount of space in that stream to carry water, and you could end up with flooding when the same conditions in the past might not have caused flooding. Now this is kind of talking off into the future. We're going to cover some other natural hazards in this class, like fires, hurricanes, earthquakes and landslides. Flooding is actually associated with lots of other natural hazard events. There's been big floods that have occurred because of earthquakes. What will happen sometimes is you get a big earthquake, it'll create a landslide, that landslide will move downhill and sit in a river valley and form a natural dam. And then the water will rise up behind that natural dam, keep rising, eventually it'll go over the top of the dam and when it does it, it starts eroding all that material away. And you can get a failure of a natural dam that was caused by a landslide, that was caused by an earthquake. So we see flooding associated with hurricanes, storm surges, and lots of rain, secondary effects of earthquakes and landslides, fires and coastal erosion, all linked to flooding as well. So as this semester goes on, we're going to talk about flooding a few other times other than just in this class devoted to flooding. Okay, any questions at this point? All right. One of the more interesting aspects of flooding is how humans tinker with the system. We love to manipulate nature. And sometimes we do a really good job of it, and sometimes we really suck at it. And when we do it wrong, things can go really bad and people can get hurt. One thing we love to do with rivers is dam them. We have dammed every major river in the United States except one. The Yellowstone River is the only major undammed river, and every year we have people who want to put a dam on it, either for flood control or for irrigation. There's lots of reasons why people like to dam rivers. Think, what are some reasons why we dam rivers? Can you think of any other ones? Produce power, hydroelectric power. That's one of the main ways to, that we use to put up dams, to produce power. But we also do it to control flooding. If you have an area downstream that floods a lot, what we like to do sometimes is put a dam up there to catch all that water that would normally flow, and then we'll release it slowly over the next month or two so that it never impacts people downstream. The only problem with that is that you get a lot of unintended consequences with dams. What dams do is they stop water from moving. And when you stop moving water, you create a new base level. Remember we talked about base level last class? Base level is the lowest point to which a river will flow. Typically that's the ocean. But when you put up a dam, you stop that river from moving. That's a new base level. And what happens at base level is that's where the stream stops moving. And that's also where the sediment that the stream is carrying drops out. So over time what happens are these dams start to fill up with sediment that's being brought down by rivers. What does that do to the capacity of your dam over time? It shrinks it down, it can't hold as much water. So over time, its ability to hold water to prevent floods gets less and less and less. 
so it becomes less effective in preventing flooding. Now, of course, we can send in big, heavy equipment and dredge out that sediment, try to clean it out, but where do you take it? Where do you put it? Not everybody wants a big old pile of sand in their backyard, right? So this is sometimes difficult to figure out what to, how to dispose of all this sediment, because it can be quite substantial. The other thing that it does is it gives people living downstream sometimes a really salt, uh, false sense of security. And people like to then, oh, we have this flood control dam upstream. We can now build along the river. We can now build along the floodplain because the flood control dam is going to take care of flooding. Well, it'll take care of a lot of floods, but it doesn't always take care of all the floods. The other thing, too, that you get with dams is one thing about water is that the colder it is, the denser it is. So if you go to the bottom of a reservoir, the water tends to be really cold. You guys probably know that from swimming in lakes in the summer. The surface tends to get really warm, and as you go down deeper, it gets colder and colder. When they release the water downstream, it tends to come from the base of the dam. So that water is going to be cold, and it's going to be really clean because all the sediment is gone, right? All the sediment's dropped out. So you may have had naturally a nice warm, muddy stream where fish like squawfish, warm water species thrived really well. And then suddenly you put in this dam, all the sediment falls out, and you release just cold water. And now you have a cold, clean stream where you used to have a warm, muddy stream. And now things like the squawfish don't like it, and they become endangered. We have lots of streams in the U.S. that have endangered fish, fish species because we change the sediment profile of the stream and we change the temperature. We call that thermal pollution. It doesn't mean that there's actually chemicals that are injected into your water, but changing the water from 70 degrees to 40 degrees, if you're a squawfish, it's just as bad as throwing cyanide in it. They can't survive. So you end up with things like trout surviving really well downstream from dams, whereas the native species do really poorly. So again, a couple of unintended consequences. Because you change the slope of the stream, you get deposition upstream, but then when you release water downstream, it doesn't have any sediment in it, so it looks to pick up some new stuff. So suddenly now you're getting erosion downstream at rates that you wouldn't normally get. So the river is going to adjust in ways that maybe you don't want it to in response to putting a dam on it. And we put dams on everything. So again, thermal pollution is changing the temperature of the water downstream by releasing water from the base of the dam where it's very cold and clear. So bottom line, you can take a warm, muddy stream and turn it into a cold, clear stream. Now maybe you as a person like that better. Oh, I like the cold, clear streams better. But the native species that have lived in there forever, they don't like it so much. Urbanization. Urbanization is just a fancy term for people settling in an area, putting up structures and infrastructure to help them live better. Well, this affects flooding in a big way. When you put buildings on the ground, that's less room for water to move. So if you build in a floodplain, water that makes it onto the floodplain has less area to flow through because all these buildings, and that's gonna make the water deeper and the flooding worse. So you tend to get more floods and you tend to get worse floods because people have put stuff on the floodplain.
The other thing we do is we love to pave stuff. We put up a lot of what's called impervious cover. So this is stuff that we build that prevents water from soaking into the ground. Basically then it creates more runoff. So rooftops, roadways, parking lots. All of this is called impervious cover. Structures that do not allow water to soak into the ground. So it increases the runoff. So more water makes it into your stream and the water gets in there faster. Water flowing across a natural surface towards a stream tends to flow a lot slower than it would on concrete. And in fact, we design roadways to get water to the stream as fast as possible. You guys, you've all been on the roads, right? And if you look on the edge of the road, you've seen those grates, the sewer grates. Now, a lot of people don't actually know this. Do you guys know where that water goes? You guys have heard of sewers, right? Everybody's heard of sewers. There's actually two kinds of sewers, and this is something I want you to remember. Okay, two kinds of sewers. One is called a sanitary sewer. That takes dirty water and moves it to a treatment plant where the dirty water is cleaned up and then released back into nature. So if you flush your toilet, okay, all that nasty stuff, it goes to the sewage treatment plant. Here in Greeley, it's on the south side of town. There's a big treatment plant out there. All that water that goes down your sink that you flush, basically stuff from buildings, it goes to the sewage treatment plant, it gets treated, and then it gets dumped back into a river, okay? So it gets cleaned up, mostly. There's some things it doesn't clean up, but we can talk about that later. That's a sanitary sewer. There's also stuff called storm sewers. And that's what you see along the edge of your road, okay? That's what those grates are for. All they do is move water off the road quickly, and that water goes directly to the nearest surface water source, nearest lake or river. So if you have water in your street, it runs into those storm grates, and it actually goes here in Greeley to the Poudre River. Okay, so if you're a smoker, I don't care if you smoke, that's your business, but if you're driving and you flick your cigarette out the window, I'm going to give you the finger, okay? I hate that stuff. And you know why? Because you know where that cigarette actually ends up? in the river. Anything you throw on the roadway is going to end up in the river the next time it rains because the rain is going to wash everything off the road into those storm grates straight to the river. So don't throw stuff on the road. It's just like throwing it in the river. You guys see people throwing stuff out the window. It's just like walking right up to a stream and throwing it in there. It's going to end up in there next time it rains. Point being for flooding, is that those storm sewers move water really quick into the river, don't they? I mean, if that water had to move across the land, it would take a long time. It would have a lot more opportunity to soak into the ground. With a storm sewer, it only takes a few minutes and it's in the river. So that means the water levels can rise much faster than they would naturally. So it really exacerbates flash flooding. And because you cover urban areas with so much of this impervious material, that means that less water soaks into the ground, and that means that we have less groundwater. And right now that's a big deal, because here in the US and basically all over the world, because we have so many humans, doing so many things on the Earth's surface that all of our surface water bodies are polluted past the point where you can drink them safely. So you either have to spend money on a treatment plant to clean up the water before you drink it, 
and those are very expensive. Or you can suck water out of the ground. Groundwater tends to be a lot cleaner. We still find ways to pollute it, unfortunately. But it tends to be our, now our last big source of clean drinking water. And because we put all this impervious cover over such large areas when we build cities and towns, less water soaking into the ground, so we have less recharge of our groundwater systems. So we have less groundwater, clean groundwater, available for humans. And I mentioned this just a few minutes ago. Bridges, if not constructed properly, can make flooding much worse. If the water level rises to bridge level, that bridge is suddenly going to act as a barrier to downstream water movement. Mostly, bridges are designed to handle twice the amount of water as the biggest flood ever recorded. So they give themselves lots of leeway. So you find out what's the biggest flood that's ever been here. I'm going to make my bridge high enough so that twice that much water can actually flow underneath in case there's a bigger flood. And usually that works pretty well. But back in 2013 here in Colorado, some of our floods were 10 times bigger than any previous flood. And a lot of bridges were wiped out. And because the bridges act as a barrier, that water then spreads out farther when it hits the land. So now future bridges are going to have to be built to accommodate more capacity, and that means more cost to you as a taxpayer. So one of these indirect ways flooding impacts you, you might not even live in a flooded area. You might not live in an area that ever floods, but your taxes might go up because we have to rebuild bridges in places bigger than we had before because we've made flooding so much worse. So flood control dams, we mentioned this a minute ago. So what you do is you put a dam and you leave the reservoir fairly empty so that it can catch water the next time you have an event that would normally flood a river. And then that reservoir fills up, and then you slowly release it during dry times so that downstream from there, they don't hit with as much water. And that's what this hydrograph is trying to show. The red is what it looks like without a flood control dam, and you can see you get these really high downstream flows. But if you put in a flood control dam, that reservoir can store some of that water to be released, be released later. And in this, you can see that basically the peak flow is cut in half. And then once water levels recede, they start letting water go. And then downstream, the water will be a little higher than normal, but hopefully not flooding. Now, this is all well and good unless you end up with a situation where you get more water coming into a reservoir than the reservoir can handle. And this happened with our floods back in 2013 up around Estes Park. So Estes Park is a, has a dam, it has a big reservoir, and lots of water was coming in. So they were holding that water to lessen flooding downstream, but then the reservoir filled up. When the reservoir is filled, what do you have to do? you have to release water. And it's already flooding downstream. So suddenly you send a big influx of new water into an area that's already flooding. And that's exactly what happened. I had friends who watched the water come up and they were moving their stuff upstream. And then they didn't realize that the dam engineers were gonna to have to release a bunch of water because the reservoir was filling up. And they said as they were walking down to their house, they watched the river come up a couple of feet in a few seconds. Uh, one of my friends said their Jeep washed away just instantly. It went from being fine one second to washing downstream the next. And it was all because 
they weren't able to hold enough water in the flood control dam and had to actually release some. So it gives people downstream kind of a false sense of security. Flood control dams can work, and they work quite frequently the way they're intended, but there's always consequences to building these things. One is that they're not cheap. Flood control dams typically cost millions to tens of millions of dollars. And then inevitably what happens is whenever you create these reservoirs, you know, the idea is to put water that would normally flood downstream into these reservoirs and then release it and then wait for the next flood control dam. But people love lakes. They love them. They want to take their boats on them. They want to swim on them. They come recreation sites. So once you get these reservoirs, people don't want to see them drained constantly. So the dam engineers are then kind of tasked with an impossible job where they need to keep some water in the reservoir to keep people happy for recreation, but that then lessens their effectiveness for controlling floods later on because that's less new water that they can then take in. And like we said before, it encourages people to build downstream from the dam. Oh, we have this new flood control dam. We don't have to worry about flooding anymore. Yes, you do. Maybe not as often. But when things go bad with a flood control dam, they go really bad, like we mentioned before. You have flooding, and then they have to release a bunch of water, which makes the flooding worse. So you might not get hit with the floods as often, but when you do, they tend to be exceptionally bad. So it's still dumb to build on a floodplain, even if you have a flood control dam. Sure, you won't get hit with as many floods, but the bad ones will be worse. No one likes paying taxes. Our politicians are always looking for ways to reduce our taxes. That's always a campaign point. I'm gonna lower your taxes. Nobody likes to pay taxes. So what the government does sometimes to lower your taxes is they pawn off infrastructure to private businesses and let them run it. And sometimes that's fine. We do that with prisons. You probably hear one of the political things going on right now is that a lot of prisons are actually for profit. They're not government run. They're run by private businesses. So they actually get paid more by having more prisoners. And that's something that a lot of people don't wanna see, more prisoners. Well, we do the same thing with dams. We sell these off to private businesses and let them run it. That reduces your taxes. But then what tends to happen is businesses make money by taking in more than they spend. So a lot of times they will skimp on maintenance so that they can make more money. And dams fail. In fact, the two deadliest floods that we've had here in the U.S. are from dam failures. So it's estimated right now that about 60% of our flood control dams are privately owned here in the U.S. So you save on taxes, but you don't always have the oversight of these private businesses to know that they're doing the right thing and maintaining their dams. And occasionally these dams fail. And sadly, we have lots of old dams here in the U.S. Most of our dams are very dated. 
need work, but we don't want to pay the taxes to provide the money for this. So I would expect to see more dam failures as we go on over time, unfortunately, as a lot of these age and start to uh, develop weaknesses. And finally, we've talked about this quite a bit already. Dams are not a foolproof method of preventing floods. They're human built, they have flaws, under certain conditions, they will fail. And our worst flood disasters in the US have been caused by dam failures. It's hard work managing a dam. You have to know how much water's coming into your reservoir. You rely heavily on government agencies to give you good predictions about what rainfall amounts are going to be, what runoff amounts are going to be, so that you can manage your dam properly. But sometimes Mother Nature is hard to predict, and scientists get it wrong. And when scientists get it wrong, then dam managers get it wrong. And they can have their reservoir capacity exceeded, which means that your dam can fail, or you have to release a lot of water at precisely the time you don't want to. We have a lot of flood control dams in the western United States. And these are areas that are earthquake prone, prone to landslides, other earth hazards that can affect the dam itself. Most dams are made of earth or concrete, and over time they weaken. They need repair, they need maintenance from time to time. Some are poorly designed, the second deadliest dam in the United States, the St. Francis Dam, was just poorly designed. It developed a crack not long after it was built, and then it failed in the middle of the night and killed several hundred people. As scientists, we get better with forecasting over time, but we're never perfect. And if scientists get it wrong, then dam managers get it wrong. And when they get it wrong, then people downstream tend to pay the price. And when a dam fails, that's about the worst that can happen in terms of flooding. That's just a massive amount of water that no stream will be able to handle. So for these reasons, again, you can argue whether you should even have flood control dams some people that believe we shouldn't have any of these things. Remember, they change base level. What was one of the benefits of flooding? The agriculture, the agriculture right? It gets this new layer of sediment every year. What happens when you put a dam up? What happens to all that sediment? It sits behind the dam, right? So one of the best benefits that we get from flooding, you don't get when you put up a flood control dam. Because that new flood control dam puts up a new base level, sediment drops out, the water downstream is clear and cold, and that's not what you need to replenish your farming areas that are downstream. Okay, let's just end it there. Uh, next section will take a little longer. Um, you'll have Dr. Larrick again on Thursday. I'll probably see you guys in a month and a half or so next. So enjoy your time with Dr. Larrick. If you have any questions on any of this, make sure you get a hold of me. Um, I will put the PowerPoints up from today uh, in case you didn't get all your notes. should be up later today as well. Again, if you have questions, come see me. Have fun in the snow. <laughs>